Right, um, as promised, straight on. Um, it's my great privilege to welcome Professor Barry Cooper, um, who is going to talk about, as you can see, can machines decode? Barry. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully you can hear me at the back. Is, is the PA working? Uh, can, can you hear me okay? Oh, that's great. <laughs> Um, some of the technical problems we were dealing with early on, it kind of reminded me that um, one, one thing that Bletchley Park embodies is the kind of alliance between the abstract and the physical. And different communities see, see compu computation in different ways. Um, certain, uh, the, the, I guess, the engineering uh, uh, end of the spectrum, that they, they see things as uh, very ad hoc and dealing with uh, difficult uh, physical problems like we had uh, earlier. And for the mathematical end, it's, oh, it's just a Turing machine. And, uh, and I guess there's been some kind of friction between these different communities over the years. And I'm going to talk about um, this kind of um, interface between abstraction and the physical and uh, the way it's embodied in uh, Bletchley Park, um, in, in, uh, in, in Turing's uh, um, work and, and uh, person, and uh, I, I guess in the human brain as well. And, and of course, that's, that goes back to Descartes and, and the kind of, uh, uh, what's the relationship between mentality and, and the, the physical uh, brain? Right, so um, I, hope, uh, I hope you can see this. It's, it's slightly dark, but... Um, um, okay, so the title of the talk is taken from, uh, uh, it's essentially taken from this famous paper of Turing's from uh, 1950. And he, he famously asked, can machines think? And this, this, uh, this kind of question has, has been echoed uh, uh, th throughout, uh, throughout the years. His time back in, I think, in 1996 with uh, uh, Turing's, uh, Turing's words on, on the front of the, uh, front of, uh, the cover here. And uh, what, I, what I want to try and uh, con convince you is that actually um, uh, the key to this question is, is the decoding. It's decoding of information, drawing information out of uh, sometimes um, uh, very complicated information. And what I'm going to talk about a little bit is, is about this kind of abstract uh, idea of... Um, uh, the difference between different levels of information, uh, the, the fact that it, well, nowadays uh, the, the big buzzword is, is big data and people are always talk about big data and, and it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it kind of crops up in all sorts of different contexts. Well, decoding is about taking big data and drawing some kind of uh, basic meaning out of it that, uh, that we can make use of, often in, in computational ways. Oh, I should just say, um, I probably have too many slides, so if, if, I, if I run out of time, I should just have to cut the talk off. I've, I've been told by the chair that he's going to enforce the, uh, the, tie, the schedule, so uh, let, let's, uh, let's do our best. Um, OK, I, I just want to... Uh, there's all sorts of contributions that Alan Turing made, um, and uh, I, one, 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 of the the one of the other themes of this talk will be that uh, Bletchley Park actually played a huge part in Turing's thinking, and uh, a, Turing and Bletchley Park is kind of a, a marriage made in heaven, as it were. It, it's, uh, um, Turing has, uh, has benefited Bletchley Park in lots of ways through, through the, the kind of uh, prominence he's had in, in the media and so on, uh, belated prominence. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, Bletchley Park meant a lot to Turing and it meant a lot to his thinking. It, in, in a, people look at it and they say, well, it rather distracted him from his mathematics, but actually it played, it played into the way he thought scientifically about things. And uh, many of the kind of key contributions he made later on would never have been made if he hadn't been uh, uh, involved in the kind of practical uh, work of Bletchley Park. Right. Quick, quick review of the early days. Well, of course, the early days were um, he he um, he was a child of the empire, as it were. His um, his parents were working in India most of the time, and his mother, came, uh, mother and, and father, sort of came back to visit visit them. And he was fostered, and, and he was born in London, of course, in in 1912. Um, uh, he was fostered. Um, uh, him and his brother John were fostered. Um, they, they went to primary school together. They, they ended up at uh, different um, public schools. Uh, J John, who didn't have a quite such a kind of close relationship with Alan, uh, claims to have uh, saved him from Marlborough, and he went to uh, uh, went to uh, 
showboard instead. And you can see the kind of development of the man. Here is a rather thoughtful young lad in, in uh, 1927 when he first arrived at Sherborne. And you see the kind of intense kind of focus, that the inner kind of mental world as, as it seemed to be uh, developing over the years. He had, he had things of his own personally that he wanted to work out. And uh, it, this is reflected in the science. And there's a kind of uh, an important kind of um, a, um, uh, an interplay between the personal and the, uh, the, 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 uh, the success in, in science as it uh, played out later on. Now, of course, we know that uh, what, what happened with Turing, of course, was that um, um, he had a long, uh, a, 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 a full career, a full scientific career in a short space of time. And a lot of that was lost to us for many years. Um, and, and it's only in recent years that um, uh, knowledge, all sorts of things, is coming back to us. Um, it ended up, um, it ended up uh, prematurely in 1954. Um, Turing made some of his most uh, key contributions, which in a, se in a sense reflect what he learnt from the Bletchley Park experience um, in, in Manchester. And here's, here's the house that um, uh, he, is, is, uh, he lived in, in in Manchester and, and died in. Um, in. In a sense, it's up for sale. If you've got a million pounds, I think you can buy this house. It's uh, something like 900,000, I think. It, these are the people that live in it at the moment. Very, very nice people, I think. If any, anybody visited the house? I, I think you can go and knock on their door and they, they, they will uh, let you have a look. Um, Man Manchester, of course, Manchester was, uh, was um, in a sense, uh, a rather, rather kind of a, a complex experience for Turing. He, he, uh, some of his most interesting work he, he, he produced there. Um, he died there and he was persecuted there. And, but Manchester since that time has been rather good to, to Turing and um, has uh, uh, honoured him in, in all sorts of ways. And um, here's, here's one, of the, uh, one of the statues, of course, uh, my favourite statue is at Bletchley Park. It's the, uh, the, the slate uh, uh, statue that uh, we'll see later on. But um, this, this, uh, this, uh, this, this statue of Glyn Hughes is also uh, a, a rather nice uh, um, contribution to uh, Turing's memory. Um, things are rather, uh, things played out in a rather raw uh, terms uh, at the end, and you can, uh, you, you, get, you can get a sense of the kind of um, uh, inappropriateness and rawness of, of the ending of, of this uh, uh, very vital and uh, mentally um, alive man that, that, that this, this should have been the ending of his, of his life. Of course, uh, in, in his, his Turing, he was a, he was a, um, a, a close to a Olympic, uh, uh, a Olympic standard marathon runner. And uh, there's a nice interview on the web. I don't know if anybody's listened to it. I, I know some people here will have. But there's, a, there's an Alan Garner interview with uh, Turing. And, and Turing, here's Turing running. And, he, and he, he said to Alan Garner that the reason why he ran was in order to think. And uh, here, you, here you've got, again, this, this kind of alliance between the physical and the mental. That actually the, the, the physical conditions have to be right for the, uh, the abstractions to play out. Now, 2012 was a centenary, and it, in, in some ways it was a kind of belated um, acknowledgement of, uh, of uh, Turing's um, uh, uh, history and work and uh, personal, um, uh, uh, personal history. And I, I just, there's, there's so many events that, uh, that happened around that time and are still playing out now. That there are things planned for uh, next year, this year and next year. Um, here, here's one that, uh, that uh, uh, was in Milan. Uh, it was Turing uh, uh, a stage case history. It was actually very close to, um, in, in, in its treatment of Turing's life, it was very close to um, um, Hodge's um, biography uh, of Turing, but it also had a, had a, a great kind of psychological, um, uh, a great psychological um, capturing of what it meant to be uh, Turing and uh, his, his thinking. Um, and of course, uh, I, I, so I can't, I can't give an impression of all the things that happened over 2012, but uh, dear to my heart is, is, is all the kind of uh, 
uh, the, uh, the writing uh, about Turing and about his work that has, has come out of it. And there's, some, there's, some brilliant, uh, there's some brilliant publications that have, have come out of, uh, of, the, of the centenary. And uh, in particular, you can see Jack's new book there, which, uh, which I, I should say has, has got some uh, fantastic contributions. He, he's, he, he's, uh, he's, he's adept at getting people who won't normally write for you to actually write, uh, to write something and, and uh, share their thoughts, uh, in, in this case, on Turing. And here's, here's the, uh, the book that um, I, I was involved with, which uh, almost killed me. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I was working overnight, uh, for, for, to, it, o overnight uh, many, many times during 2012, and it still came out uh, a year to 18 months late. And uh, it, was, it was a great uh, uh, piece of, uh, a great chore in a sense. Right, 2014, well, um, people say, well, isn't Turing a household name now? Isn't it or a bit overdone, you know, this, all this publicity for Turing? No, it's not. Uh, you, if, you, if you go out into the real world, of course, you'll, you'll know that uh, sometimes you'll mention Turing and they'll say, who is Turing? And I, I would say that uh, although it's within, within the cognoscenti, as it were, um, Turing is, is kind of uh, extremely well known. Um, the kind of uh, broad knowledge that one, one would hope for hasn't quite arrived yet. 2014, we'll see a little bit uh, uh, more. Um, uh, we'll see a little bit more about um, uh, uh, Turing and his work reach the, uh, the broader masses, if you like. And uh, two, two, things that, uh, two things that we, we hope are going to happen is that... Uh, the, the imitation game that's just being shot, uh, and uh, I, th I think the, the film crew was here for a little while um, uh, with Benedict Cumberbatch and, and, uh, and so on. Um, here's, here's Kira Knightley. Uh, a lot of these things are controversial, by the way, of course, because people are, are scared that uh, actually this is not going to be true to the history, that the commercial pressures are going to um, uh, uh, sabotage, if you like, a true account of, uh, of what happened. Well, th there's going to there's going to be some bending towards uh, you know the, the, the filmmakers surviving in the real world, but uh, but all the things we've seen so far have been uh, quite quite promising. And uh, Kira Knightley, she does represent a real person, and um, and the relationship um, did exist and was a was a close one over a number of years. Um, the Turing pardon, of course, another controversial... Uh, people say, why, why, why are we pardoning Turing? Surely Turing should be pardoning, um, you know, uh, the, the people that did things uh, to him, the, the people that uh, didn't protect him after his service at Bletchley Park during the war. Um, well, it's going to happen. It's going to, hopefully, um, it's, it's, uh, the government has said they won't oppose the... Uh, Lord Sharkey's uh, bill, and we're hoping that uh, this, this will actually uh, play out in some kind of positive way as far as the memory of Turing goes. Now, um, OK, May, I, I'm a mathematician and uh, I, I'm kind of interested in, in, the, in the, um, the kind of abstract, uh, the abstract ideas around c computation and computability and decoding and... Uh, uh, and, and information, and um, what, what I'm. But at the same time, I, through my involvement with Bletchley Park and uh, people who are, have been involved in the development of computers and uh, and uh, uh, bioinformatics and, and other such uh, things, which uh, involve in a material way with the world, I, I've I, I've become interested in the kind of this kind of, um, uh, if you like, this building of um, uh, computational um, artefacts, if you like. The building of the brain, the building of computers, uh, the building of that, the world that we live in as, um, as a, a kind of material host for computation. And this is what, uh, this is what Turing uh, uh, was uh, um, very much gripped by, right, right from childhood. Now, he was... He was personally um, ideally suited to this kind of uh, scientific adventure, if you like. As, uh, here's Max Newman, who was um, Turing's uh, protector and mentor th throughout most of his life. Here he is uh, saying um, uh, he, he was at, uh, he was at uh, 
um, Cambridge uh, and Manchester, both places um, associated with, uh, with uh, Turing and, uh, and, of course, Bletchley Park. And here he is saying that uh, actually, despite Turing's work in pure mathematics, he was actually at heart a pure mathematician. He built everything up from, 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 the, uh, from the basics. He was interested in physics. He was interested in the way the world computed at a very basic level. Um, he went to uh, Paul, uh, uh, Dirac's lectures in, in, uh, in, in Cambridge. Um, um, his, his, um, his, his only uh, PhD student, uh, Robin Gandhi, um, was started off as an applied mathematician and only got interested in the logic through, through Turing. And, uh, and here's, here's, here's a late um, uh, postcard from, uh, from Turing to Robin Gandhi shortly before he died, um, talking about his ideas about physics and obviously uh, influenced by what he'd been uh, reading about relativity and so on and, and, and uh, his... Uh, his uh, 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 involvement uh, with uh, his participation in, in Dirac's lectures, and you can read um, uh, you can read about this in, in uh, Hodge's uh, uh, in, in the uh, collected works, which are kind of very hard to get nowadays. Um, it's, uh, so some, uh, one, of the, one of the downsides of the book that I, I was involved in editing is that Elsevier seems to have shuffled off the collected works, which was what we were rather keen not to happen into, um, uh, you don't seem to be able to get it from them anymore. And, um, and if, you go on, if you go on eBay, the, the collected works is going to cost you something like £200 a volume. There's four volumes. It's a, it's, it's a rather sad end to the collected works, maybe. Um, right. Well, paradoxically, of course, Turing is best known for um, de-embodying uh, the, the, the computer. And uh, this, is, this is what the computer scientists and mathematicians think of when they think about uh, computing machines. They think about a Turing machine. And, uh, of course, it was revolutionary in the sense that, um, that before, um, before um, this period in time, um, computing machines were like... They were, they were more calculating machines. Every time you wanted a particular job done, you, um, you built a new machine. You know, you, you, you changed the physical kind of... Um, the, the physical embodiment of the computation. Turing's, Turing's model, in a sense, does away with that. It, it says that actually... Um, the, clever, the cleverness of the, um, the embodied computation can actually be captured in abstract programming. And so the hardware, the hardware is just, you know, it's so trivial that uh, for mathematicians it, it just exists in your head. Um, and uh, and uh, the, the, model, the, the model of the Turing machine, despite its uh, simplicity of hardware, um, the, the, uh, the programming um, enables you to compute anything that you could uh, conceivably um, uh, compute via instructions. Now, um, so, um, I, but I should say here that, that this, uh, Turing being a kind of uh, uh, a man embedded in the physicality and the basics of things, um, he did have um, a specific model behind, uh, in, in his head when he, when he invented the Turing machine. He had the idea of um, a computer which would be uh, normally a person following instructions um, at that time uh, and, and generally a, a, a woman computer. And um, he, he, would, um, he had this idea of um, that the person um, who was carrying out the computation, uh, not applying human intelligence, but just following instructions, and uh, the, uh, a nod in the direction of the real reality of the human brain was the, 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 uh, the use of a thing called an internal state to construct the, uh, to, to structure the, uh, the computation. And that's kind of based on the state of mind, if you like. So if you're in a particular state of mind, then you compute in a different way. And that, that, was, the, uh, that was the idea behind this. Now... There's a contradiction here, of course, as, as anybody who's tried to build a computer knows, is that um, actually it's not a Turing machine. There's, there is an awful lot of embodiment involved in building a real computer. And uh, David Levitt's book, which uh, some mathematicians don't like, cause, partly because he wasn't a mathematician and uh, people are sort of sniffy about uh, people writing about things they know about, uh, you know, um, from a different uh, vantage point but he actually he has a nice kind of psychological um, 
uh, involvement with with Turing. Of course, he's gay, the same same as as, as Turing. But um, but he has this idea. He has this idea of Turing identifying with the machine, and I think that's a nice kind of insight into the way um, he, he ha Turing had a kind of visceral involvement with the machines that he was um, he was talking about. And here's a, here's a Here's a, a, a photo, this has cropped up all, all over the place, this, this nice image from uh, um, this graphic artist from Houston in Texas, uh, uh, calls herself Gin Wicked, and uh, here, she, here she has uh, Turing actually as a Turing machine, and uh, the, 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 the tape is, uh, is passing through uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, uh, the black box, if you like, of uh, uh, Turing's uh, thinking. Uh, and, well, I won't spend time on this because I'm going to run out of time, but uh, there, there's, uh, there, there's all sorts, in the, in the popular culture, there's all sorts of kind of uh, plays on this uh, mismatch between the abstraction and the, uh, the, the embodiment of uh, computation. Here's, here's somebody saying that a, 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 Turing, a Turing machine needs a, a basically an infinite tape, and, of course, we know that's not practical. So here, here we've got, um, here we've got uh, this... this uh, computer scientist is saying, Turing solves the halting problem only to discover that the real problem with his machine is what to do with all the tape. And uh, it's, um, and, and there's other, there's, 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 um, there's Lego um, and uh, Meccano um, Turing machines, and you can, you can see the Turing machines working on, on the web if you, if you look around. Hopcroft and Ullman, famous computer science, uh, computer science book, um, uh, defines a Turing machine using this kind of um, uh, notation. And he, here's your Turing machine actually uh, travelling around the tape, doing things and, uh, uh, and uh, thinking, uh, thinking uh, how is it that I'm just uh, thought of as an abstraction and it, whereas actually I'm a physical um, uh, executor of uh, computation. Now, the key thing, which um, I, I, everybody knows about um, the, the Turing machine. Well, I say everybody. Everybody in my community knows about the Turing machine. But many people in my community even don't understand what's important about a universal Turing machine. The, um, the 1936 paper in which uh, Turing uh, um, describes the universal Turing machine, it has this... Uh, it uses the fact that if, if you... Um, if you characterise your programmes in, a, in, a, in a, a particular language, in a particular form, then you can actually list all the possible programmes. And uh, this, if you can list them, then you can code them up as numbers. And uh, this enables you to actually uh, list, if you, if you accept the Turing model of what, it, uh, what, uh, what um, computation is, then it actually gives you a list of all, of, all the... Uh, all the kind of possible programs, all the possible functions, mathematical functions that you can um, uh, you can uh, compute using a computer program, and that's that's rather clever, isn't it? And it, but it's a it's a trick, and it, and it kind of hides something. What it hides is the fact that actually machines are not codable in general. I, I, I my my laptop, it's. Um, it's there. It's it's um, it's following programs, but it actually is a physical entity, and um, it's going to do things at some point. It could crash any moment. Um, it could. There's all sorts of things my computer could do that it's not programmed to do, and uh, and that is not coded in. And and um, so so there's a kind of uh, a kind of um, a piece of sleight of hand here, which is tremendously important for the history of the computer because it did away with punch tapes and, and uh, other ways of physically inputting um, programs into machines. It, it enables you to code up programs as numbers and, and that means they're data the same as any other data. And you can feed them in and you can modify your program using your computer. You can, uh, you can uh, receive over the internet um, updates of your software using the fact that um, your programs are actually all coded up and not, no longer physical um, um, entities. But now, OK, here's the mathematics. What is a number in, in the classic? Uh, we'll look at this a, a little bit in, in a minute. But classically, um, a number is a very simple piece of information. Of course, storing it is not simple. Even numbers are not simple. But uh, they're at the bottom of the heap anyway. Type zero in, in, uh, in Russell's uh, terminology, which uh, I'll mention again later. Um, 
What about the um, what about the machines? The machines. If you were trying to describe my laptop um, uh, precisely, you'd probably be uh, you'd be involved in. Um, not just real numbers, but kind of assemblies of real numbers. That would be type two. And uh, uh, so, so all machines are type zero objects. There's something, uh, something a little simplistic going on there, useful for computer science. Now, of course, um, this is something I'm not going to talk about, of course, but, um, but uh, the, the universal Turing machine and its relation to the history of the computer, another controversial area, um, to what extent was ad hoc investigation uh, at the root of the development of the computer, to what extent was Turing's universal machine? Well, um, John von Neumann muddies the waters because he, he, he understood what Turing was doing. It's not, a, it's not clear at what point um, he, he kind of uh, uh, realised uh, uh, exactly uh, what he was getting from Turing's work, but he played a big part in the development of the computer in the United States. He had a famous report in, in the 1940s, but he did, he did later, uh, later in life uh, acknowledge the, uh, uh, leg, uh, the, uh, the, um, the debt that uh, the, the history of the computer owed to um, at least the understanding of the, the history of the computer owed to Turing's universal machine. Uh, very quickly, a very dominant paradigm, the paradigm of the universal Turing machine. Um, and uh, Turing could be excused for being rather optimistic in 1944 at Hanslope Park, where he went after Bletchley Park. In, in, he's quoted as saying, um, uh, I'm building a brain. And uh, he, he was building... Um, a, a, a computing machine. But this, uh, this has been uh, run with by uh, philosophers, particularly Hilary Putnam, and uh, the idea is that you can actually um, take this as a model in, for all sorts of computational contexts. In particular, you can take this model into um, uh, neuroscience and, and uh, philosophy of, of, uh, of the mind, and you can think of um, the, uh, what the brain is doing as being uh, some kind of computation which can be uh, transferred to different physical hosts. And in particular, maybe um, uh, you can build a machine that uh, uh, does what uh, the human brain does. It's a very ambitious kind of uh, picture and, and it kind of takes the, the Turing model to its uh, furthest uh, 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 application. And then there's people like... Um, uh, David Deutsch, who, uh, who uh, is, is a key figure in the early um, development of the early uh, model of uh, quantum computation. And here he is, um, he, he successfully reduces the, uh, the, the, uh, the model of quantum computation to the Turing model. And here he is saying, well, perhaps we can do the same for consciousness. Perhaps, you know, we'll have conscious machines uh, pretty soon and, uh, well, in, in the course of time. That's... That's uh, not something that people would uh, go along with uh, in, in general. Right, um, let's get back to the embodiment then. Uh, and the, uh, the kind of real world um, context of Turing's model. The background is, is the optimistic... Uh, uh, 19th century. He, he's the, the greatest um, uh, mathematician in many ways of the 19th century. And, and it, his, here's his famous um, uh, um, proclamation that uh, th there, there should be no unsolvable problem in mathematics. It's, it's, uh, sometimes people are a bit hard on him, you know, he's, it's, uh, uh, but the, the, the sense is that, uh, that really that there's, uh, there's nothing that uh, you can't compute. Now, of course, we know that as he was saying that, um, uh, Gödel, uh, Kurt Gödel was in another part of uh, the same city, Königsberg, uh, young man, 22, giving, uh, describing a theorem which would um, uh, uh, put a... Um, uh, uh, put an end to that kind of optimistic view of what information is and its computability. Um, it took till 1936 for the um, computational, uh, um, the, the computational side of Turing uh, of uh, Gödel's theorem to uh, 
uh, to be worked through. And Church and Turing, uh, Church, a, a senior mathematician, Turing, a 23-year-old um, um, starting out researcher. Um, his 1936 paper, the whole, the whole point of the paper was not inventing the computer. It was showing that actually computers can't do everything. Even though we hadn't got computers, he had a theorem which said that uh, computers won't be able to do everything. There are unsolvable problems, and this plays out with uh, so-called Church's theorem. Well, uh, Turing had it as well. Um, it, there's, no, there's no computer program which will tell you whether um, a sentence in natural language is um, logically valid. Uh, things get complicated. There's no program for that. Now... What was, what was so important about Bletchley Park was that um, it was grappling with information in, in, at different levels. And this, this had a, a physical dimension, which was uh, the development of early um, uh, calculating machines. And uh, sorry, uh, early, I should say, computing machines, um, programmable machines, in a sense, that, uh, that could do, uh, that could multitask in some uh, particular context. And here's, um, here's, here's the, uh, actually, is the Turing Welshman bomb, I believe, is the correct terminology nowadays. Um, Welshman, uh, um, uh, Gordon Welshman, w had very uh, important um, input to the development of it. And of course, the, the, the Poles, of course, um, as well, have, uh, um, should be uh, acknowledged in, in, uh, in the history of this. But Turing, Turing's um, role was, uh, was key as well. Um, so at Bletchley Park, we had uh, development of computing um, uh, machines, which helped uh, with grappling with the big data. If, if, if you look at the kind of uh, the noisy kind of uh, um, uh, meaningless stuff that, that was coming through from, uh, from Germany and, and, and the, the Atlantic, um, that is big data. And, and that, that's what, uh, what these guys were... were uh, uh, that these people were, were, were handling. Now, of course, uh, in, in the post-war period, uh, Turing played a role in the development of uh, uh, real computers, if you like, uh, although uh, it, was, it was kind of frustrating, his involvement, and he didn't stick with it. Um, the, the, his, uh, his ACE report came out the same time as, Hilb uh, as um, von Neumann's, um, didn't get the same uh, attention and didn't have the same influence. Um, but, uh, but uh, the, the, there was a computer developed um, uh, using uh, Turing's ideas, scaled down, which, uh, which I don't think played out well with Turing. He went off to Manchester before this happened. But uh, the, the computer that was, uh, was developed was, uh, was one of the fastest, was the fastest in the world for a short period. Now, um, the history of the computer, well, all sorts of uh, speakers today will be talking about aspects of this. Um, the, I, I won't spend time on this, but uh, there's, there's programmable computers which were not universal machines, but ones which uh, you could program. They were what, they're what you would call nowadays Turing complete. Um, they could do anything, but, uh, but you had to have punch tapes and, and uh, such like to um, program them. Um, and then stored program computers, um, Manchester, um, the Manchester Baby, didn't do anything much. It was a toy, but, uh, but it, it had the it had the, uh, it, had the um, it embodied the principles of the universal machine. And uh, then there was the Ed Sack at Cambridge, which is a more serious computer and was actually used by the university in Cambridge uh, for a while. Maurice Wilkes didn't quite get through to his centenary uh, this year, which uh, which was kind of sad. I think he uh, it would have uh, it would have been uh, another uh, grand occasion. Um, and then there's, uh, there's commercial computers and um, uh, Franti Mark I in Manchester and uh, the, the Americans, of course, who get all the credit. Um, oh, no, I, should, <laughs> I should mention, uh, of course, uh, um, Colossus, which we're going to hear about, which was, in fact, um, took, uh, took some of the ideas that were uh, um, uh, germinating at Bletchley Park and took them to a whole new level. And uh, I, I, I guess Jack is going to talk about this, this later on. And of course, of course Ch um, Churchill destroyed, um, ha had, had all the machines uh, destroyed. I think some of them sneaked off to um, uh, GCHQ and uh, I, I don't probably... Uh, 
you, you, you could tell us more about that, but is, is this correct? Um, um, we understand that two went to GCHQ. Yeah, and nobody knew about that at the time, did uh, they? No. <laughs> <laughs> and they were actually used for special purposes, which you, you're not allowed to tell us. I think this is probably more Tony's um, uh, line. But, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah um, basically, they were just uh, superior calculating machines. They were used for log tables. And yeah. When we left East Coast and came to Cheltenham, they were broken up and the parts were... But, it, but is it true that the British government gave um, Enigma machines to their friends all around the world? <laughs> it's, on, it's on Wikipedia, is that not true? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you get a Wikipedia just, uh, page put right? <laughs> um, OK, so anyway, the, the machines got destroyed uh, for, for all intents and purposes. And uh, it, there was a, a tremendous amount of uh, difficulty in reconstructing all sorts of things. And the, the people who dedicated their time and intelligence to, to these uh, um, um, did, did a wonderful job. And of course, you can see the results at, uh, uh, mainly at Bletchley Park. And uh, here's uh, Captain Jerry Roberts, who's uh, happily still, still with us and uh, um, still able to tell us about uh, those times. Um, right. Now, talk about um, the physical embodiments of computation as being big data in a sense, something that's more complicated than a, than a type zero um, uh, piece of data. Well, the real business of Bletchley Park was dealing with the, um, the, the big data of decoding. And um, I, it's a kind of sore point. You, Churchill uh, describes uh, the workers at, at Bletchley Park as the geese that laid the golden eggs but never cackled. And they didn't, so not, until the 19, not, not until the 1970s. And some never did. They never told even their, their family. But uh, one, one can't help the feeling that, um, uh, OK, I, uh, this, is, this is a slightly kind of uh, jaundiced view of things, but I, I, I kind of think that uh, scientists and decoders and people that, uh, th whose lives are thinking about things are more like um, uh, battery hens than, uh, than, uh, than uh, uh, geese that laid the golden eggs. This is, this, is the way, this is the way things kind of play out in the modern world, and science is always, and Bletchley Park is always looking for uh, funding and proper support from uh, from governments, and this is this is just a f this is all governments. This is, this is a fact of life. People don't understand how important ideas and um, um, what goes with them um, are in the modern world. Now, um, information. There it is, messed up. It's um, it's uh, something that uh, something that you have to extract the meaning of sometimes. So sometimes you get information, it, and it takes a lot of intelligence to bring out the meaning. And um, this is this is what um, this is what Bletchley Park was involved in doing. It was involved with this kind of massive data and extracting. Uh, here it is decoded by um, uh, the uh, uh, by coding, coding machines. And uh, there's a lot of information about this in uh, Hodge's book, of course, in relation to Turing and in many other books in, in, uh, in relation to the whole, uh, um, uh, the whole enterprise. Now, one of the things that um, one of the things which is kind of in a, in a, is fundamental to um, dealing with big data is sampling. And this is, this is something that um, played into uh, the, the work at Bletchley Park and had, a, had an influence afterwards. And um, uh, people like um, Jack Good, assistant to Turing, and other people, um, uh, Mitchie as well, uh, uh, developed um, uh, statistical methods for drawing out meaning from data which was, uh, which was um, uh, large and um, confusing. And uh, they, in particular, they used uh, uh, statistical methods of Thomas Bayes uh, from, you know, uh, developments of that work from the, um, I guess, the 18th century. And here's Thomas Bayes' notes on, on this sort of work he was doing. And here's, here's Jack Good uh, in the front here. Um, playing chess. Um, and Banbarismus, of course, was, uh, was one of the great uh, uh, breakthroughs in, in the Battle of the Atlantic and, uh, and so on. Enigmatic statistics is taken... Um, I, I, I wrote a paper with a, a, um, 
uh, Kanti Mardia, who's, a, who's a, a statistician at Leeds, and we wrote a paper on... He, he, this was his idea. He, 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 called, he, he decided to call a paper um, uh, Turing and Enigmatic Statistics because there was a lot of kind of clever ideas went into this, uh, this system of banbarismus, uh, which uh, later on played out, I think, into the um, de decoding of um, uh, other... Uh, other, other um, uh, encrypted um, information. Right, well, in the wider world, in, in the wider world, um, I guess that the, the most, the most, uh, one of the most uh, complicated contexts is the, uh, is the uh, um, economic context. There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of data there. There's a lot of kind of need for extracting meaning and making predictions and, 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 and making uh, computational models of what's happening. Most of it a failure because things are so complicated. And here's Nassim Taleb. I, don't know, I always ask how many people have actually read The Black Swan. Has anybody read The Black Swan? Oh, great. This, this is a higher percentage than usual. <laughs> Um, I, 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 last time I asked, uh, there was one person in front of us, what do you think of Nassim Taleb's book? He said, awesome, he said. <laughs> and uh, the thing is that uh, Nassim Taleb is not a mathematician, so he, he's, he talks about randomness when he might be talking about incomputability. But um, what, what, what he, his, one of his main uh, claims to fame is that uh, before the crash of 2008, he was predicting it. He was saying that these, this kind of confidence that you know what's going on is quite misplaced, that things are going to go wrong in ways that are not envisaged. And here, here he's talking about randomness in the real world, that, um, that things are not, uh, not easily computable. And here he's saying, the more I think about my subject, the more I see evidence that the world we have in our minds is different from the one playing outside. And uh, so th there's messages from the real world that tell you that um, uh, things are more complicated than, um, than they at first seem. Uh, um, I stayed with Robin Gandhi uh, before he died and um, I asked him about... Um, um, I asked him about uh, Alan Turing and, and why, why he'd, he'd commit suicide. And he said uh, a, a week before he saw Turing, he was perfectly cheerful and, and seemed nothing wrong. And, um, and then he's, he's, he's not in any... Uh, I mean, I know Jack takes a different view, but he's, he's not in any... Uh, I, I, presumably you've talked to Robin Gandhi as well, uh, but uh, he, Ro Robin, when I talked to him, was in no doubt that it was suicide, but he said that... Um, things that happen in the real world, they're not, um, they're not easily computable. Um, some things happen for no reason, one, one, one might say. Um, oh, by the way, here's Andrew Hodges, of course, the, the author of the, uh, uh, of, of the Turing biography, which is probably the best source for information about Turing's life. And, uh, yeah... Uh, right, OK. <laughs> on, on, to the, on to the main message uh, of this talk, which is that Turing's, Bletchley Park and Turing's engagement with big data in different guises is, has, has a kind of, is, is, is a legacy. And it's something which is still playing out and, and still gives us lots of puzzles and uh, inform uh, uh, issues that, that are not yet sorted. And this idea of higher type information is, is, uh, is probably um, key to this. And uh, incomputability and uh, embodiment. Here's... Uh, I won't go through all, all this, but, um, but uh, Kurt Gödel... Uh, lots, of, lots of people have had, inf uh, had interest in higher type information. And here's his, uh, his Kurt Gödel um, explaining um, uh, a little bit about it. And he, and he says that um, in a world in which things are built, information uh, has a kind of origin with simple things. Um, and in mathematically, uh, we take individuals, which typically are numbers, uh, properties of individuals, which could typically be real numbers, if you, if you think mathematically about these things. And then relations between individuals, which could typically be, um, uh, 
shapes in three dimensions, if you like, proper, uh, mathematically described, and so on. The thing is, the type structure does not stop. There, it goes way beyond anything that we can um, uh, mentally uh, take ownership of. And the reason, the reason for this kind of analysis of information, uh, uh, it goes back to Russell's work on uh, salvaging mathematics after he'd, after he'd uh, threatened it with, uh, with the paradoxes. Um, his, uh, Russell's paradox, um, you can get round this by um, taking a type theoretic um, analysis of information and then you don't get that kind of destructive self-reference that... Um, that um, uh, brought us the um, paradoxes. Right, um, right. I think we're running uh, out of time now. I so say out, out in the real world. Well, in computer science, there's there's uh, there's um, um, an engagement with higher information in the sense that, um, okay, if if you go back twenty years, then the Turing model of computation was. Um, it, that was it. Uh, now you've got the, the largest um, uh, uh, theoretical computer science organisation in the world, the Association for Computing Machinery, and uh, here they are. They're mounting on, on their on their website a discussion about what is compu uh, computation, something which had presumably been uh, settled uh, a long time ago, uh, we, particularly with with, with Turing's uh, work, um, and. The key part of this, the key part of this um, uh, discussion in this symposium is we're not talking about functions so much, we're talking about processes. Now processes are uh, much harder to boil down to um, simple um, descriptions in terms of uh, numbers. And this, the, in the real world, we've got the, um, uh, the internet, we've got all sorts of uh, computational situations in which uh, processes are more important than, um, or, or are, are the kind of items of study. And Turing had an interest in this. He, he had a, Turing had a, a kind of knack of um, uh, mentally fixing on issues which were kind of important to uh, discovering uh, to understanding how the world computed. What was the computational uh, underlying uh, structure of the world? And he, he looked at um, patterns in nature. He, here's a book, a beautiful book, which has just come into its, just came out last couple of years, fourth edition of this, uh, Hans Meinart, the author. He, he, essentially, he takes Turing's work and runs with it in the context of uh, nice pictures, and he has some of the mathematics involved as well. His, his, his emergent um, uh, patterns on a, on a tree. Uh, it's in Kazakhstan, actually, that one. Um, what Turing did, he... Um, I mean, who would have thought of it? You look at these patterns in nature and you say, there's some mathematics there. And what, that's what he did. He, he, he came up, he thought, well, it's, it's, it can all be described in terms of basic structure of um, uh, chemical uh, interactions. And he came up with um, differential equations, the solutions, uh, the solutions to these differential equations. He, f uh, he fed them into, um, this is a big, big area, of course, um, he fed them into uh, the, uh, the, the new computers that, that were being developed at, at Manchester. And what's this? This is, his, um, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the uh, computational uh, simulation on, on, a, on a new computer uh, in Manchester, done in the dead of night when he could get to use it. Um, and what, is it, what has he got? He's got a simulation of uh, patches on a cow's back. Um, was it Frisian? Anyway, it's, um, it's patterns on a cow's back. And um, something interesting here is what's happened here, um, you've computed something in nature. And it's a pretty good, it's an approximation. Um, and it's not actually, it, this isn't actually the, the, uh, the solutions of the differential equations. Uh, it's a sampling. This is what a computer does. A computer does not represent um, um, 
patterns uh, described in terms of real numbers mathematically, it samples them in a kind of crude way, actually. I mean, it's, there's, no, there's no real statistics there, but it, it, it does it. And that's, that's why you get this illusion that you're looking at uh, patterns on a cow's back in this case. Now, this paper that, it, that he wrote, it's the one paper he wrote. Uh, I guess it's the last, uh, the last uh, real paper he wrote before he died. Um, of course, 1952 is a key year. It's the year that uh, he was uh, prosecuted. Um, this paper is actually, it's, it's kind of unknown. It, until recently, it's been unknown to uh, um, mathematicians largely. It's, it's, it's biologists that um, uh, have found this a seminal paper. And it's, it's actually his most cited paper, which surprises. People expect it to be the Turing machine paper or, or the, uh, the Turing test paper. No, this is the most cited paper of his and it's to do with physical computation. What is interesting about, uh, about, about the morphogenesis here, it's the shapes, and we appreciate that. The machine, uh, the machine has created these shapes. The machine does not understand the shapes. It doesn't appreciate the shapes. It doesn't, ha it doesn't attach meaning to them. Our mind does, and, and so we, we have a kind of um, um, a sense in which the mind is perhaps doing something um, in the way of decoding that, um, uh, that the machine um, uh, doesn't uh, fully participate in. And the same sort of kind of um, uh, phenomena one can recognise in many different contexts. So for instance, you know, what, what about some um, uh, emergence of large-scale structure out in the um, uh, wider universe? Um, and then, of course, you look at the halting problem. And how, do you get, uh, how did you get um, uh, the halting problem? Well, what you did, you collated lots and lots of computations. There were lots and lots of... You put them together. You got, uh, you got something, um, you got something um, uh, incomputable. Um, now, what about the human mind, which is the main point of this talk in the last five minutes, I guess? Um, what about the human mind? A point about the um, emergence of um, shapes is that they're in a sense surprising. You've got some kind of big, big data and they're, they're out of it comes shapes. It's like, you know, you, you've got very, uh, like the, the sea on the seashore. It's very, you, un, in detail, you understand what's going on and then you see these shapes, these waves and so on, and it's, it's much harder to describe those. They're, they're of a higher type. Um, well, what's, what's happening here, um, back in the early part of the um, uh, 20th century, um, uh, Poincaré was interested in creativity and mathematics, suspecting that there was something non-computational, in a sense, going on there in a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, anticipatory way. And, um, and then uh, around uh, 1945, uh, early 40s, um, about the time of Bletchley Park, of course, uh, Jacques Hadamard, mathematician, um, took this, uh, took this um, uh, thinking of Poincaré and uh, came up with a very nice analysis of, um, uh, of um, creativity in mathematics. And what, what's being described here is Poincaré, um, this, is, uh, this is from Poincaré's account, he thinks about a hard problem, he can't, he can't, he gets stuck, he, he just can't get the answer. He goes on a trip, he steps on, he's, he's, he forgets about the problem, seemingly. He steps onto a bus, and as he steps onto the bus, the solution to the problem comes into his mind. What's happening there? It's not conscious thought. Um, there's some kind of emergence of um, uh, understanding in this, in this particular sense. So it's the same kind of phenomenon, uh, in a sense, to this kind of other surprising emergence of um, uh, shapes and... Uh, and the sort of, sort of emergence that uh, plays out in, in many other situations. And, and the interesting thing is, it was, he, didn't, he didn't need, to, he was talking to somebody uh, on the bus. He didn't, need to, um, he didn't need to write anything down. What he got was encapsulated um, a solution that, that he, he knew 
he had a perfect certainty about it and he could just carry it in his head encapsulated in a kind of uh, uh, a packaged data form uh, uh, for later on which suggests a, a computation in a sense but not one which um, is uh, <laughs> not one which is easily reducible to the Turing model. Now, Turing around the same time, in fact, uh, before this, he was looking at the same sort of thing. Um, I'm not going to say much about this, but he, he, he had, he, it was a very abstract paper. Almost nobody reads it. It's 60 pages and it's all framed in terms of lambda calculus, a different model of computation. But it's, it's, got full, of, it's full of ideas and in, in a typical Turing kind of um, passage, he, uh, he talks about What's the meaning of all this stuff that he's, that he's um, uh, invented? Um, it's all about intuition and ingenuity. And he started off trying to transcend the, uh, the, the Gödel incompleteness theorem by uh, using a hierarchy and hoping to somehow computationally go beyond what you can uh, get out of uh, theories, uh, first order theories, uh, uh, a la Hilbert. And... Um, what he's found is that actually, okay, you can get to uh, you can get to um, uh, new and valid ideas, but there's something un uh, there's something in co uh, not computational about the way you would actually um, uh, rescue that information from this context. And so he's talking about intuition and ingenuity, and he's saying he set out to uh, prove the. Um, uh, the value of ingenuity and what he's found is that actually you can't do away with intuition in fact intuition is the key um, element here um, and so what's what's the, so here we are back to the key question what's the link between the physical brain and uh, uh, mental um, creativity such as uh, you know great scientists um, demonstrate the link could be um, uh, mathematical models of what's going on here. Mental supervenience, that's the philosoph phil philosopher's description of what's the um, connection between these. When they, don't know, when they don't know what the connection really is, they, they say, well, there is a connection, we'll call it supervenience. Um, I'm not going to, I'm running out of time. Here's, here's, uh, here's uh, Jae Gwon Kim, who's made a great study of uh, supervenience and... Uh, the link between brain and uh, mentality. Um, brain and higher type computation. Right, this is what it's all about. Um, here in the physical world, it's simple. You see, you see a, a kind of a Turing machine-like termite following uh, certain algorithmic processes, presumably, within a real context. And it comes up with this. And uh, the termite doesn't understand what it's, what it's done. The, the, the community of termites doesn't understand what it's done. We do. We look at it. We, we, we stand by it. We look. There's an, an amazing shape. This has come out of. Now, this is, the world has computed this. The, world, the termites have assisted the world in computing something of higher type, of type 2, I guess one might call that. Um, in the abstract world, there are kinds of suggestions of uh, things uh, such as that going on. And that these, these are, these are uh, quotes from Turing saying that um, real intelligent thinking mistakes are involved there. You can't, you can't, a, a, a machine that doesn't make mistakes isn't, in, isn't intelligent, essentially. Um, that, that, that suggests something, something different is, is, is going on in, in intelligent thought. Um, and then he's, in, he, in his later, in his later um, talks, he's talking about common sense. Obviously, in a sense, thinking uh, in terms of common sense being the brain doing something a little beyond what, um, uh, what the machine's doing. I don't have time for this, uh, this quote. Fantastic book. I, I, I don't know if anybody's come across this yet. But what it's talking about is the... Uh, what is the point between the division between left and right hemispheres? It describes the, um, the kind of the more algorithmic nature of the, uh, the left hemisphere and the more kind of fuzzy kind of uh, sampling of big data, um, aware um, reducing uh, big data to uh, stuff that the left hemisphere can use. That's what the right hemisphere is doing. Talks about um, the connection between the two hemispheres Strangely enough, the connection between the two hemispheres is, um, is uh, 
uh, is designed to stop them interfering with each other. It's not to help them work together so much, although they do work together, but it's to stop these two types of thought um, interfering with each other. Um, models, well, back to the uh, neural nets and so on, fantastically interesting area, all sorts of interesting things. Here's Paul Smolensky, a prize winner, talking about um, the, 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 the kind of uh, unexpected things that uh, neural nets can come up with. And here's um, Stephen Pinker talking about they don't actually show intelligence, that there's actually more to intelligence than just... Um, uh, uh, the connectionist models which, uh, which uh, the, the uh, computer scientists and the mathematicians are so keen on. And what he, what he talks about is this kind of uh, recursion. The fact that one has kind of uh, big ideas, one reduces them to packageable ideas and feeds them into further processes. So, so in other words, there's a kind of, um, there are loops, that there, there are, there's a recursive process which um, the brain is, is uh, involved in, which... Um, uh, which isn't captured by the, 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 uh, the models that we have. And then there's people at different ends of the spectrum as far as in, uh, artificial intelligence goes. Here's Rodney Brooks, who takes a kind of, uh, um, uh, takes a kind of experimental, um, um, uh, experimental um, uh, getting your hands dirty kind of approach to ar artificial intelligence, builds robots, uh, very, very uh, creative but uh, not particularly theoretical person. Uh, and here's, uh, here's the other end of the spectrum, Marvin Minsky, who's, uh, who's uh, talking about the failures of artificial intelligence. Now, why I put this up is just to, to, just to, give, just to show you that there are famous people who uh, still think that there's um, a problem in reducing what the brain does to a simple uh, Turing machine model. Um, OK, just to finish off with, this is what I work on, things like higher type computation. Main point of this slide, higher type computation, there's no nice models anymore. There's a confusion of models. Here's, here's a graph with all sorts of different proposals for models of higher type computation. And uh, so unlike, unlike the, um, the Turing machine context, uh, you can't, um, you don't have a thing called a church Turing thesis which, which tells you that the, the model is it. That is the, that is the natural model. There, there might be more than one natural model or none at all, according to... Uh, and, and, but that's what the world seems to be uh, doing, is doing higher type computation. There's another approach, which is um, modelling... Um, computational content of the real world, which is largely expressible in terms of uh, interactive computation using Turing machines. Um, Turing, uh, Turing involved interactive Turing machines by just giving uh, the notion of an oracle, feeding a notion of an oracle into the, into the model. And that's good enough to, to capture things like um, Newtonian uh, mechanics and so on. Not completely, but the basics. And uh, that, that model turns out to have a lot of complexity, a lot of interest, and that's, that's basically what I work on. Um, and then just to finish off with, what about, I haven't mentioned the Turing test. Um, there's, I guess in, in the scientific world, there's not so much regard given to the Turing test, although it's, people can't get rid of it. it it's, it's, uh, and, and the interesting thing about it, of course, is that, is that uh, it, it, it kind of recognises the primacy of the, um, the human brain as a kind of benchmark for intelligence. And uh, uh, here, he, he, uh, this, is, this is the key... Um, this is the key kind of uh, summary of where Turing ended up in relation to, to, to the human brain and machines. He's still hankering after um, uh, the brain being a Turing machine, but what he's ending up with is the fact that interaction with the human, the, uh, human beings is still necessary and advisable. And, uh, of course, this is what we had at Bletchley Park. We had the machines, the new machines developed. We had a, a tremendous amount of human creativity thrown together with this. And this was the model which, uh, which produced the, uh, the goods at that time. 
Out in the real world, of course, the, uh, the Turing test is an endless uh, uh, source of jokes and um, amusement. And it's the one thing that uh, I, I would say probably is uh, kind of, uh, ha has re received some kind of um, uh, mass um, acknowledgement, um, even from people who've never heard of Turing. They, they talk about the Turing test. Here's, here's somebody, I failed the Turing test. I mean, the human being failing the Turing test is... Uh, yeah, and and here's, here's somebody, his boss fails the Turing test, and it's, uh, um, and that's it. <laughs> Barry, thank you very much indeed. Um, absolutely perfect timekeeping, so thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have time for a, a, a very small number of questions um, and if you'd like to ask your question I'll attempt to paraphrase it, uh, partly for recording purposes uh, and so that the rest of you can hear. So anybody got a question for Barry please? Yes? Um, is, there any comment on, um, is there any relationship between the DNA code that we hear about and his work in computational mathematics? Is there any um, connection between the DNA code and Turing's work in uh, mathematics? That, that's a great question, actually, because these kind of issues crop up in lots of different areas. And there was a, there was a sense in which um, uh, people thought that if they could um, capture the genome, they, then, then they could um, uh, predict all sorts of things and get the answers to all sorts of questions about how people were and, and what was going to make them ill and, and, and all these sort of things. And, um, of course, the, the trouble is that uh, what you've got is that the genome is quite complicated. And in a sense, it's a computer program. But, um, but, what, but what, what, it, what it does is it, it works in conjunction with um, big data, the real world. It, it, embodies, um, uh, it, it embodies interactive uh, computation, if you like. And out of, out of, out of the genome, you, 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 get, um, uh, you get some things nicely predicted, but other things you've got absolutely no I idea. You get no information fr from, uh, from that, uh, that kind of way of looking at things. So if you want to look at um, why someone's happy or unhappy, or you, you, want, you want to know um, uh, why they made a particular decision even, or, 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 or you want to know why they turned out to be such a, a, a person uh, morally, or, or whatever, you can't get that, for, that from the genome. And, and so, so I think it's the same, it's the same thing that, that kind of uh, occurs in many, many different situations. Any more questions? Yes. A comment on that. Um, some of those questions are being answered through epigenetics more so than, than genome and genetic, um, which is a yeah, I, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm stretching, but, yeah, yeah I'm but, the, but the, the general drift is, you get the same thing in um, evolution, of course, um, the, 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 there's, the, I mean, we all know that almost any area you go into which has got any kind of degree of complica uh, complication, there's controversy, and it's not just controversy between um, uh, people who don't understand what's going on. It is, this, is co uh, this is controversy between really, really clever people who have a, a huge understanding of, of their subjects. Uh, you know, the, I mean, the, the sort of uh, disagreements you get between... Um, um, uh, the, 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 yeah, I mean, the people in, people in ev evolution, uh, you know, Stephen Rose uh, and um, uh, Hawkins and, and so on. And um, it's... Um, and often it, it boils down to, it's a kind of dialectical process. You know, you hope there's going to be some kind of better understanding comes out of this. But I think what you, what you do need is some kind of understanding of the, the kind of the levels of information that are embodied in, in the world. And the fact that there are, there are levels that are going to take us right out of anything that we can ever kind of grapple with or take ownership of. And, and that's, that's, that, that's what the mathematics will tell you. You have the mathematics and you have the real world and you have modelling. Why, why do, why do people, why do people um, disagree about things when they know so much? It's because the actual meaning that comes out is, is emergent in itself. And, it, and, and if there's no proper computation um, governing, if there's no 
real kind of um, agreed model of computation that you can implement at, with higher level information. If, if all we can do is um, have fallible statistics to, to deal with big information, then, uh, then we are going to get disagreement and we're living in a world in which, which is always going to be an adventure and is always going to um, uh, jump up in uh, disagreeable or exciting ways uh, at different times. Right, have we got one more very quick one? Yes, sir. Some of the states of mind you mentioned, such as yeah. ingenuity, would you consider that nature or nurture? Ingenuity, nature or nurture? In, well, ingenuity is a clever Turing machine in, 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 in Turing's world. Um, and... Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you're, dealing, you're dealing with... Um, you're dealing with um, is it uh, something they possess? So, uh, you see, the thing is, uh, one, one, that, that, that analysis of the left and right brain, you, you write off the left brain, you say, that's, that's just working algorithmically. No, it's not. It's representing. It's, it's, uh, it's key to uh, language. And language is not simple. You know? I mean, people write whole books. You know, Stephen Pinker writes whole books on language and how it, uh, how it originates and, and so on. The, the way, the representation of information and the way we handle it is, is really complicated. So I, in, ingenuity, well, I, I guess ingenuity one, you know, is, is clever people, you know, but, uh, but it's also, uh, there's, a, there's an intelligent uh, substructure to that. So. Barry, it's absolutely enthralling. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Thank you. Thank you.